Welcome to the PhD in Progress podcast, episode one. We're so excited to discuss grad school, career development, and to help build a community of our ultra talented and hardworking peers. Let's go. to be more distinguished than Morgan Freeman, <laughs> I hear. So, Jason wrote out this wonderful outline of what we're going to talk about today, and, and one of the questions is, who are we? That's kind of loaded if you think about it. <laughs> you know, so I guess, in one sense, we're all graduate students. We're all sixth years, which means we're in the final stage of... I prefer to call it DCE. I say That's... senior. I oh. like senior. D- DCE is dissertation completement enrollment. That doesn't put a number on it, so you don't have That's to. It's a very optimistic think dissertation about completion. How long you've been here. Yeah. Very good. Okay, I like that. We are <laughs> DCE graduate students, uh, which focuses less on our past and more on the near future, um, in which we will all write a thesis and get our PhDs. So, Jason, what do you study? So, I study developmental biology in a field that's called left right patterning. So, it's actually in zebrafish and we study how there's asymmetric organ placement in the zebrafish body and this applies to all vertebrates and so that's what i've been working on for the last five or six years and, and why do people fund your lab um cancer no not cancer <laughs> <laughs> i tried that angle it doesn't really work for my stuff yet but um so people study or people fund my lab based on different conditions uh the the biggest and most important one is probably uh, congenital heart disease. Uh, so left-right patterning is important for positioning the, the heart in the correct place and correctly patterning the different ventricles, which pump blood to the different areas of the blood uh, body. And so uh, that's the biggest part of how we get funded in our lab. It's translatable to all uh, vertebrate organisms that we've studied so far. So obviously humans and mice and rats and frogs and fish so all these use the same kind of mechanisms to establish it but i'm really interested in uh and i've been working on this in my career transition to working at some kind of job involving biomedical devices specifically biomechanical devices that use some kind of tissue engineering with machines to create some really good good kind of quality product uh there's a really cool lab at ucsf that works on an artificial kidney that works like this where they culture kidney cells and put them in a little machine and that actually is a better device than going in for dialysis that's all the time. That's so cool. Yeah. That's really cool. It? So let's see if... Actually, that, that's... Plug for that lab. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Roy lab, I'm pretty sure. Very cool. If not, I'm going to edit that out. <laughs> Isn't there a lab at Wake Forest that um, is working on 3D printing organs using... Oh, yeah. Like... There are a couple of labs yeah, like that. That's been the coolest so thing now. Far. That is really cool. Yeah. I'm excited about 3D printing. Yeah. So, um, so I guess Nikki, what do you work on? I'm also I guess I'll start with um, I'm also uh, interested in biomedical engineering and applied science in the sense that you know medical devices are really cool. I started out as an engineering undergraduate studying bioengineering, and then I got more and more interested into neuro in neuroscience, um, and so that's what I'm currently studying uh, here. Uh, I work on the retina, uh, more specifically how the retina converts light into electrical signals. Um, so there's a lot of different questions around that. You know, what is the encoding process? What are the underlying biophysical mechanisms? And then also, what is the code itself? So what are the signals that end up going to the brain that later form the basis for your vision? Um, and so these are the broad questions that are asked um, in our lab. Uh, and my question is specifically how the retina can extract patterns in time. So if you have a repeated pattern, um, and it stops or um, changes frequency or some something changes about it, um, the retina will signal that violation of the pattern. Uh, and so do you have to do like recordings or something for this? That's or right. How? So I, I do um, patch clamp electrophysiology. So I'm recording electrical currents from individual neurons in a retinal slice preparation. So it's all in vitro and we use the tiger salamander as our model system. Um, so there are uh, vertebrate reptiles. Um, they're cold-blooded, which makes their retina really easy to work with. Um, they have very large retinal cells. Why does that matter, cold-blooded um, to the retina? Um, 
It matters in, in that we don't have to uh, have careful temperature control of the preparation while we're doing the recording. Yeah. So if we were to use a mammalian retina, we'd have to be at 37 degrees Celsius, plus or minus like half right. a degree. Um, whereas for me, I do my recordings at room temperature, which in my room varies wildly from like <laughs> 20 degrees Celsius to like 25, depending on the day, on the right. time of day, and you know, the HVAC system. So, so could you translate this somehow and like use a retina as a camera eventually if you're able to figure out the coding of well the so the point cells. is uh, one of the one of the ways we sell our research is we say hey the retina isn't a simple camera it's doing all this complex computation um, and so I think um, actually what uh, the opposite of that is the killer app for, for this research the um, there are a lot of people who are blind or have visual defects and if we understand enough about the neural code and the way visual signals are represented in the brain, then we can start to build artificial devices that can replace the retina. And there are actually a couple of companies out there that are working on retinal uh, implants. So basically cameras connected to electrical arrays that stimulate your optic nerve um, and then uh, provide some rudimentary visual signal that your brain can learn to interpret. Uh, and so that's one of the things I'm really interested in. Um, learning about maybe working in as man we're work. between the two of us we're so close to building a cyborg i'm like so excited <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> ray kurzweil if you're out there the singularity is nigh <laughs> <laughs> so abigail what's up with you what are you studying um i work with yeast baker's yeast as a model system my lab is really a classical genetics and cell biology lab so we're very much doing basic science um most of the people in my lab study cell fusion so Yeast cells can mate. They grow toward each other and fuse cells to form a diploid cell. Um, and so there are several fusion events that happen in that process. The cells fuse, the nuclear membranes fuse, the inner nuclear membranes fuse. There's a lot of fusion that goes on. And most of my lab studies that. I actually don't study that at all. Uh, <laughs> I have a completely separate project where I study a gene that's required for both mating and meiosis. And so the question that I'm asking specifically is how cells change type because um, budding yeast go through a cell cycle where they bud off daughters they reproduce asexually but there are times during your life where they can respond to signals from the environment and make a developmental decision of some sort so that decision might be to mate because to mate they have to turn on a bunch of different genes they have to grow toward a partner and then they have to you know do all of these things to the cellular morphology and it's a lot like the same sort of differentiation you might have from a stem cell, right? That decision to say, I'm going to integrate these external signals and I'm going to stop what I could do and I'm going to do something else. So we're looking at that decision both in mating and meiosis um, and how the cells make that decision. And I study a gene that's required for both those processes. And I'm asking both how the cells make the decision and also if you are a gene or the protein product of that gene required for more than one process, how do you do the right one at any given time, right? If you have multiple hats to wear, how do you know which hat to wear so that you don't make the wrong decision? Because yeast are single-celled organisms, so if they screw up a decision like this, that's, you know, that's it, right? They're yeast dead. Heaven. You, they go to yeast heaven. <laughs> there is no yeast cancer. <laughs> there is no, that's debatable. We could go into that, whether there's yeast cancer or not. But um, so it's really important. Like for them, the stakes are very high, right? Yeah. That they make the correct decision. Um, and so that's what my work has been focused on. And I sort of wandered into this project accidentally and have gone in a totally different direction from most of my lab. And now you're kind of wandering out, right? Now I'm wandering out. Um, I'm finishing up my dissertation and I'm leaving this summer. Um, my long-term goal is to actually stay in academia. I would like to get a primarily teaching position or a job that balances teaching and research. I don't want to do a big R01 lab, but I really do like education. Um, but I'm also interested in science communication, science writing, medical writing, um, all of these aspects of sharing science with a broader audience, whether that's freshmen or politicians or people on the internet, you know, that idea of communicating science. Because I think for the most part, our community is not as good at that as we need to be. Um, and those of us who are interested in that should really make it a priority. We'll be next door to Neil deGrasse Tyson though, all right? Hanging out, yeah, hanging out with, with Neil. Yeah. Uh, I doubt we'll be hanging out, but. He's up there. Is that yeah, the next Columbia. podcast hanging with Neil? Oh, God, I would listen to that. <laughs> I would so listen to hard. that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess the question is, so 
you know who we are that that you might have cared before. But why are we making a show? Why are we even doing this? Why are we making a show? Yeah, I don't know. What are we doing here? What, what <laughs> does this mean? <laughs> yeah. Why are we here? Um, so I think we're in a pretty unique position that we're all kind of on our way to graduating within the next year or so or six months or however long. One month. How, one month, a couple weeks <laughs> tomorrow. And um, we're all kind of looking for our next career or we have our new position and thinking about how to transition to there. But we can also look back to our current peers who, you know, might be newer graduate students still kind of developing their skills and figuring out what their graduate career is going to look like. Um, so I imagine this podcast talking a little bit more about um, – personal grad school development so how what kind of tools you can implement in your own life um, to get you to achieve your goals as well as a little more of the professional so like career development how how we're gonna find our next career who are we gonna talk to what kind of networking are we gonna do you know what does publishing mean and writing and all this kind of stuff uh, this is us going back in a time machine to talk to ourselves in year three <laughs> and say, listen, self of the past, Wake up. here is what you need to do. Also, start keeping a better lab notebook. Does anyone have a good line from... Uh... Bill and Ted's actual event? No. Well, that yeah, that too. <laughs> Let's say back to the future. Oh. Yeah. Either one. I'm not good at quotes. Something about gigawatts. Gigawatts. <laughs> so I, I guess that was kind of why we started a podcast. Also, I love podcasts. I'm a huge fan, but... <laughs> I'm also here to hang out with my friends, who oh, I just yeah. don't see oh, very often. That's true. We don't uh, get to yeah. hang out that much anymore. You know, grad school can be a really isolating process. And so I think... Um, you know, as we say, as we're locked in a room, <laughs> we have to sign, <laughs> don't disturb us. That's right. Maybe, maybe sometimes by choice, an isolating process. But um, at the same time, you know, it, there is this extended community. There are a lot of people out there who are doing similar things to what we're doing. And they're doing it for similar reasons, because at the end of the day, they love science. Um, but you're right. There are things I wish I had known along the way that would have made my whole experience a lot better. Uh, and so, so, yeah, let's talk about those things. Yeah, I think Nikhil is right. This struggle is both intensely personal and also really universal. I mean, even my advisor, who's a you know, long-time tenured professor, had said to me, I remember graduate school being really hard and demoralizing you know and it's like well yeah it's terrible <laughs> you know because you're not sure if you can do it because you haven't done it yet you don't have the record of success you have as a postdoc where you know that you have, have gotten there and I think that over the last six years my brain has actually changed I mean the graduate school education that I've gotten was real that's true i think about things differently than i did when i got here my brain works in a different way and i didn't start grad school till i was 30 so i already f i feel like it's not the development of you know being in your 20s when a lot of stuff also changes like grad school has shaped the way my mind works in a totally different way and um and that can be a very difficult process you know i hadn't thought about that it's totally wow. true yeah. though it it's really amazing. is. Thinking about what I thought about, just as an undergrad, because I went straight from undergrad to grad school. Um, but, you know, part of it's obviously knowing things on a different level, like how my depth of knowledge, but really just thinking about questions and what I'm going to do to figure that out. Like, what I'm going to do to test, what I'm going to do to find more information. Um, and, and actually, part of Part of that process has been developing this podcast and figuring out the resources that we're going to use. Um, and, and I think it's been really helpful for my own personal development. And uh, so that kind of brings me to the next point of why on a deeper level we're doing this, or at least why I wanted to start this. And Abigail and Nikhil both been awesome with it. Um, so I think grad school has given me so much and um, partially of what Abigail mentioned but just the social setting, the, the ability to learn more, ability to express myself in a way I thought was really important. So uh, I want to give back. I want to give a way for other people to, um, I guess, get lifted by what I've learned. So um, hopefully this podcast will at least help one other person. Um, maybe me. Let's shoot for three. <laughs> Let's shoot for three. Right. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. That Get might be a little lofty. <laughs> I don't know, man. Yeah. 
So, so yeah, whatever we can do to, to help you, the listener, just let us know. Um, and I'll list ways to get in touch with us at, at the end of this. Um, um, I also would like to say that, I mean, we all know what it's like to do mindless bench work. I think that's because we're, you know, in the biological sciences side of things. But um, for me, podcasts have been uh, keeping me company while I'm alone Definitely. in the lab. Uh, and so... You know, the voices in your head? I, w- I mean, I, if if I had, if there had been something like this out there, I would have totally listened. I would to take it. Hourglass in my head all the time. <laughs> his, his melodic voice would be beautiful, <laughs> narrating every movement. Or Morgan Freeman. Morgan let's Freeman. Go ahead. Yeah, Morgan let's Freeman. go with Morgan Freeman. Penguins. Well, sorry, with, sorry, the lower level. I love yeah. Ira, but I feel like I could hire him for a bit. Um, <laughs> but yeah, podcast has really been super helpful for me. I I, I think I learn a lot more just through listening. So some people obviously learn more through reading and I do. watching. I'm, yeah, I'm you're a visual a reader. learner. Yeah, I'm a big reader. Yeah. I don't listen to podcasts. Yeah. Except sometimes Science Friday a long time ago. I don't do that much anymore, though. Mm-hmm. But I think more broadly, I think the idea is that stories are kind of sticky. Yes. And, you know, there's a lot of content, but if you put a narrative form around the content, then it's a lot easier to remember. Yeah. Uh, and so maybe we're going to be long and rambly and... and uh, Inefficient nope, in our no. <laughs> next uh, point. <laughs> what you weren't gonna let me ramble more? <laughs> no, we got a deadline. <laughs> okay. No. Okay. Go on. Sorry. No, no, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> Game over. Um. Do we get to swear? Yes. Bye. You guys. Yeah. All right. I don't know. Explicit I don't, tag. I don't, listen to, I don't listen to podcasts. I don't know if they're swearing. I just want uh, to know I before I screw it up for you. What if I bleep it out with the, the <laughs> sheep? A sheep. A sheep. Uh, sheep. Sheep yelling, is it sheep yelling like people? Oh yeah, there's like Taylor, Taylor Swift, Swift video that I watched oh, yeah. until I started crying. Oh yeah, that's really, <laughs> on a loop. Really funny. Uh, goat yelling like man. Goats, goats yelling like people. Yeah. that's what it is. Guys, it's, students yeah. do not procrastinate like this. Don't worry. Sheep are the ones that faint. It's really, yeah, it's, oh, no, that's goats. Oh, fainting goats. Oh, fainting fainting goats. goats. Only yeah. specifically fainting goats. Which which are the barnyard animals that like stack themselves on top of each other, like stand on each other? Is that are you sheep thinking about like goats? toys? I don't, no, like, I'm thinking about, <laughs> I don't think they really do that in the barnyard. Mm. Okay. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm a ways from my Midwestern roots. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and we should all go work on farms. That'd be a horrible idea. Let's, uh... So, yeah, let's uh, wrap up a bit, or... Probably. Well, what we're hoping is that over time this will evolve into a mixture of interviews, us talking about um, current research that's going on, our own struggles, people we've met, stories we know, yeah. questions you have that we can help address, and so... If you do us hate holler. us, you can at least listen to our guests, who are probably knowledgeable and funnier than... And more attractive. Yeah, more attractive, for sure. And we definitely want to talk about the things that... Um, other people have maybe not talked about about graduate school, like that it is sometimes isolating, that people can have mental health issues, that, you know, there's a way to be productive about your cynicism in graduate school. Um, What's that? Wow, productive cynicism. <laughs> Please tell Make me. a podcast. <laughs> well, wow, that, that, all right, well, check. Off well, the list, yeah. then. There we go. I'm already doing it. Yeah. Great. Yeah, so if there's something else uh, you would like to hear about, please let us know. Email us at feedback at pro- phdinprogress.com or follow us on Twitter. At We're going to have a PhD Twitter. Podcast. Yeah, we have a Twitter. We have a Twitter. It's booming. We have a website. 24 followers. Really? Yeah. One of them's I hustle me. those. One of them's me. One, oh, yeah, one of them's me. <laughs> I'm going to start tweeting. 22 followers. <laughs> going down by the minute. But uh, we're, we're serious about doing this, so yeah. let us know how we can help you. And we'll see what we can do. Yeah, we're here for the community. So whatever we can do to help PhDs in total, like just everyone, and even if sorry if this is kind of STEMI and sciency, um, but we don't mean to exclude anyone. So if you have an idea or you know want to talk about something, please get in touch with us. Um, and I have lots of friends who've done MFAs, so <laughs> you can bring them on too. They can talk about grad school. That's a real degree. Yeah. Oh. Well, it's a, <laughs> okay. Oh, it's a oh, oh. I kid, I kid. Like, like your PhD, it is a terminal degree in many fields. 
the best you can do, or the most educated <laughs> you can. <laughs> Maybe okay, the they want to edit that do. out too. <laughs> no so wait, would that. you would you say we are terminal degree candidates? We are, yeah, definitely okay. terminal degree candidates. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> so it sounds fatal. like a horrible diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, you're terminal. It really <laughs> does. <your degree>. Oy. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so yeah, tell your friends about us. Email us. Twitter us. Is that what you say? Twitter. Twitter at us. Tweet, tweet at us. Tweet at us. Yeah. Tweet at you us. really are not good at this new media. No. Then not the new new media. <laughs> never give up. Winston Churchill said, "Never, never, never give up." It's on the back of one of my triathlon T-shirts. As Wiz Khalifa said, "Keep working on that player hating degree." <laughs> Oh, we can just leave with a quote every time. <laughs> a different one, yeah. Yeah, or the same one. Or the same and one. The, for the quote of the week. Yeah, the don't hate quote. the player, hate the game. <laughs> <laughs> Parents just don't understand Tupac. <laughs> yeah. you got to fight for your right to party. Oh, all ears on us. <laughs> don't hate the player, hate the game. <laughs> I kind of like that. That sums it up, right? I I think it's it's broadly applicable. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I like it. All right. Well, till next week, don't hate the player, hate the game. We'd love to hear what you think. Stop by phdinprogress.com to leave a message or email us at feedback at phdinprogress.com. Also, you can follow us on Twitter at phdpodcast. Thanks for listening.